So my research and my current book project explore what African-American literature and art have to tell us about um, Black spatial knowledge and practice. But I'm actually not gonna talk about my research today, but instead about a class I'm teaching this semester, which grew sort of sideways out of my, my research. Um, so my dissertation back when I was in grad school emerged from the premise that you could read African-American literature, um, I'm sorry, African-American cultural production as a kind of archive, right? Of, of what Catherine McKittrick calls a black sense of place. And this was a sense of place that for lots of reasons um, evaded traditional historical record. So whether it was um, because it was erased, uh, because it was never written down, because it didn't count as spatial or geographic knowledge, um, or because it was clandestine and fugitive knowledge, uh, which intentionally evaded archival capture. Uh, so the methodological proposition of my research was to look instead to black writing and art um, and trace through that imaginative work, the kinds of spaces black communities have made and are making, uh, but also how black people have intervened with and engaged with the geographies and architectures of white supremacy and racial capitalism. Um, so while working on my dissertation, I became interested in what the methodological proposition of that project might open up for thinking not just about space, but also about time, specifically about history, Black history. Um, so if creative work can document and preserve Black spatial practice, then how might it also enrich and texture the, the, the sort of irretrievable minutia of Black history? which is often seen as sort of a, a record of loss, of captivity, of violence and death. Um, so that was sort of the question that I started with when I began to develop the class that I'm teaching this semester, which is called Counter Narratives, Contemporary Black Historical Fiction. Um, so I'll share a little bit about that class and how we've been engaging with the Beinecke um, with the support of Melissa Barton and Ingrid lennon Pressy. So big shout out to them, they've been Real, real huge help um, in my class. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, okay so uh, counter narratives inspired by John Keane's 2015 um, collection of stories and novellas, counter narratives, um, which is up up on the screen. Um, counter narrative, counter narratives, the class begins with a question. How do contemporary writers, artists, and scholars grapple with the lived reality, the vastly different epistemologies, and the unimaginable atmospheres within which everyday life, the stuff of history, took place? Departing from the traditional sort of disciplinary practices of historians, and that includes literary and art historians, um, novelists, playwrights, poets, and visual artists have long offered us counter narratives. So a way into the past that involves a constellation of research, imagination, and a determination to challenge the very ways we think of and write history. In, um, in my class, we focus mostly on experimental text um, that use not just content, but form to communicate a theoretical or political orientation toward black history. In this way, our class is also interested in the possibilities and the limits of these projects, which use creative production to variously kind of repair, restore, uh, reject, expand, rewrite um, the, the, the Black past. So here are some of the works of art um, and literature that we've been looking at this semester. This is Ellen Gallagher. Um, and these are works of art and, and literature, you'll see some books come up, uh, which imagine an attempt to represent various forms of Black life from the late 17th to the early, uh, to, to the early 20th um, centuries. And here are some of the books that we've been reading. Um, so we also look at work by scholars uh, in, in recent decades, especially, who borrow techniques from the literary and artistic to challenge their own disciplinary practices and produce alternative histories. Um, in particular, 
we ask how writers, artists, and scholars, um, but especially writers and artists, are engaging with archival material, right? So we know that a lot of historians and literary historians are constantly engaging with archival material, but so are artists, and so are our novelists, and so are poets and playwrights. Um, so in order to do this, we have consulted the extraordinary resources at the Beinecke. So um, I'm gonna just give a couple, a couple examples of how we've done that this semester. Um, I often start the class by thinking about writing that imagines and attempts to represent the middle passage. Uh, so we read Amiri Baraka's 1969 play, Slave Ship, um, which attempted not only to stage the events of the middle passage, but to approximate for the duration of the show, the experience of being inside a slave ship, right? Complete with smells, sounds, total darkness, and hard wooden benches instead of comfortable theater seats. The idea was that this immersion would induce revolution, right? This is 1969. Um, and in several instances in uh, Greenville, Mississippi, for example, and also in, in productions that were staged in Europe, audience members really were ready to revolt, right? They were, you know, up in arms and, and uh, in, in Europe, they um, basically tore down pieces, pieces of the set. Um, at the Beinecke, my class reviewed pamphlets and ephemera from the Black Arts Repertory Theater in school, uh, as well as original scripts and programs from productions of Slave Ship. Uh, we viewed the original artwork from Tom Feeling's book, Middle Passage, uh, which offered yet another counter narrative of the Middle Passage to think, um, to think alongside Slave Ship, Zong, and the work of Ellen Gallagher, which we also looked at um, in this unit. We also view the 1789 Plan of the Brooks, uh, an anti-slavery posters from which emerged what art historian Cheryl Finley calls the slave ship icon. So this very recognizable aerial view of, of the slave ship. Finley writes that slave ship, the play, quote, recreated the suffocating claustrophobic environment that the diagrammatic abolitionist drawing suggested by giving life to the actual bodies it depicted. The actors and audience members crammed together gave real life physical form to the tiny black figures meticulously drawn in the slave ship's plan. Instead of remaining still or silent, uh, silenced, however, Baraka's slave body spoke and moved about. He inserted the voices, desires, movements, and music of resistance that were absent from the static two-dimensional drawing. Um, we also read Baraka alongside primary sources about the Middle Passage, like Equiano's narrative. And this is an image from, um, from the copy that's in the Beinecke. Um, okay, so this painting by Titus Kafar uses and critiques the plantation ledger, specifically Thomas Jefferson's farm books. You can see these sort of strips of paper that are covering Jefferson's mouth um, are actually taken from uh, reproductions of his farm book. And you can see um, these are pages from the farm book that uh, Kafar uses, excuse me. And these are actually in Jefferson's papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, at the Beinecke, we view similar ledgers and account books. Um, here are some images from the uh, Austin and Lawrence account book um, from 1750 to 1758, which documented purchases and sales um, in Charleston, South Carolina. And you can see um, up here at the top, it says purchasers, right? And this list of names is purchasers. And then in the middle are men, women, boys, and girls, and those represent the enslaved. Here's a detail from the index. Um, and you can see how the enslaved appear in these kinds of documents. So uh, over on the left, you see Negroes, right? And then below, ditto, 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 right? Uh, uh, alongside sugar, alongside sundry and rum, right? Beer is also on there. Um, so this is how, this is an example of how the enslaved appear in these kinds of documents in the archives of slavery. Uh, and historical fictions are often efforts to resist the brutal reductions of black life to numbers and tally marks and, and commodities. Um, 
The Beinecke's James Weldon Johnson collection is extraordinary um, because it offers a wealth of material from the early 20th century and the Harlem Renaissance, uh, which do not so much kind of like remediate the archives of slavery and, and colonialism, but they offer more robust and capacious sort of accounts of black life in the past. Uh, and they give us a chance to see how black collectors have challenged and expanded the concept of the archive in both material and, and symbolic or more theoretical senses and, and had agency over historical production. Um, last week, we read John Keane's short story, Cold. This is the first page of the story um, on the left, which imagines the final day of composer Bob Cole's life. Cole spent a good deal of his career composing what were called coon songs. So here's an example, all I want is my chickens. Um, but he abandoned these when he began to collaborate with James Weldon Johnson and his brother, Rosamond Johnson. Um, and so here's an image of the three of them together from the Beinecke. Um, I, I just love this. I think it's, it's beautiful. I love the, the writing on the side as well and the, um, the, the, the compositional marks. Um, and then here are some images of Cole with his wife, Stella Wiley. Um, and, you know, I think in this instance, we can see how the archive itself can, can constitute a counter narrative, right? It can, it can give us a sort of hint of detail, a sense of intimacy, a sense of uh, personality, right? Um, and, and inner life that may be absent in this sort of, um, you know, arc of Cole's career, right, or, or absent in the Coon songs, right, that he, that he felt he had to make. Um, so those are just a few examples of how we use the material in the Beinecke to enrich and complicate our study of contemporary Black historical fiction. Uh, in addition to introducing my first year students to special collections, the Beinecke has been an invaluable resource for my class to experience what archival research and handling archival material feels like. Uh, the sensory, the emotional, the haptic experience of the archive is so central to these creative works that we read and, and what they're trying to do. So being able to handle these materials adds an essential layer to my students' ability to analyze these texts in generative and generous ways. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop there and hand it over to Jonathan. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. And thanks to my colleague, Eliza, uh, for her uh, wonderful presentation. And I really just want to take her class is, is what I think I conclude um, or I'm taking away. Um, I'm gonna jump right into my presentation for the sake of time. Um, so allow me to share my screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is give some overall comments about uh, my research through the book manuscript I'm currently working on called Inhabitants of the Deep, The Blueness of Blackness. And by way of um, beginning this presentation, I'd like to offer up for consideration Gilmon uh, Killmonger's now famous dying words uh, from the motion picture Black Panther, uh, not only because they invoke the unique ordeal of middle passing Africans after whom my book is named, uh, but also because of a curious slip in their logic. So let me play the video. So you can just lock me up. No. Uh, just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships. Because they knew death was better than bondage. Mm -hmm. 
sorry. Hopefully that the sound was okay. Um, so some days after Black Panther was released, one of my friends who I'm sure was not intending to be an enemy of my joy, uh, questioned whether Killmonger could literally be descended from those middle passing Africans who jumped ship because they would have died before leaving any progeny. And for a while, this apparent logical flaw threatened to spoil this moving cinematic moment for me. But I've since come to think about how Killmonger's words might actually open up how we conventionally think ancestry in some generative ways. Indeed, what does it mean to trace one's ancestry back not to a distant blood relative, but essentially to a choice, to be the descendant of a decision, of this decision to jump ship and inhabit the deep? And to what else besides Killmonger has this decision given rise? My book, Inhabitants of the Deep, wades into the waters of this unorthodox ancestry, but with the conviction born of yet another, much older invocation of those who jumped ship, one we find in the interesting narrative of the life of Olada Equiano, uh, which you'll remember um, Eliza Kelly also referenced in her presentation. So published in the late 18th century, when the splash of bodies into oblivion could still be heard, one might expect an even graver testimony than the fictional Killmonger's meditation on the courage of those who prefer death to bondage. Uh, but instead what we get is a curious suggestion that what those who jumped ship knew was not death, but life. From the deck of a slave ship in the middle of the 18th century, Equiano beheld an impossible sight, the enslaved underwater, but not dead. Of his shipmates who jumped ship, he writes, Often did I think many of the inhabitants of the deep much more happy than myself. I envied them the freedom they enjoyed and as often wished I could change my condition for theirs. In an abolitionist text committed to telling the truth about the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, why does Equiano use inhabitants, a word typically reserved for the living to describe those who we know drowned? And how can he possibly claim to envy these enslaved Africans their freedom? Yet, if we suspend our initial objections to this possible misnaming of the drowned and take seriously the lives that were lived underwater, awfully abbreviated as they were, then perhaps what emerges is a profoundly ecological vision of human life and freedom on a blue planet. Compelled by Equiano's vision of deep life and deep freedom here, Inhabitants of the Deep undertakes a black eco-critical study of the trope of water in African-American literature that illuminates what I describe as the blueness of blackness or the abiding place of the oceanic and water more broadly in the black literary imagination. Now, on the one hand, what I describe as inhabitation of the deep in the text I examine registers the radical exclusion from human society that has been theorized in black studies as social death. Consider for instance, the symbolic presence and function of water in this passage from Richard Wright's 1940 novel, Native Son, in which we find the novel's protagonist, Bigger Thomas, resigning himself to death. Having felt in his heart, some obscure need to be at home with people and failed. He chose not to struggle anymore, but the supreme act of will springing from the essence of his He turned away from his life and the long train of disastrous consequences that had flowed from it and looked wistfully upon the dark face of the ancient waters upon which some spirit had breathed and created him. The dark face of the waters from which he had been first made in the image of a man with the man's obscure need and urge, feeling that he wanted to sink back into those waters and rest eternally. Here water appears as the refuge of those who fail to be at home with people, and so of the so-called socially dead. But what also strikes me about this passage is its profound resonance with the account of creation which we find in the biblical book of Genesis, where we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, 
and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Yet the ancient waters intended by right here is not the deep of Genesis, but the Atlantic. The Genesis with which he is most immediately concerned is the Genesis of Middle Passage, which Frank Wilderson has compellingly labeled the dawning of blackness. In the Genesis account of creation, it's darkness and the spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep in prelude to a creation repeatedly consummated as good and in which God breathes and in which God breathes upon clay to create humanity. Yet in what we are given by right to imagine as the genesis of blackness, it's rather the water upon which some spirit had breathed and created bigger. Perhaps the very same spirit about which Equiano writes when describing his dramatic first encounter with the ocean and the slave ship. The first object which saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment, which was soon converted to terror when I was carried on board. I was immediately handled and tossed up to see if I were sound by some of the crew, and I was now persuaded that I had gotten into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill me. Behold the creation of bigger, what we witness in this oft-quoted passage from Equiano's narrative is the modern creation and conflation of blackness and slave. It's in the precise moment that Equiano realizes that the ship waiting for its cargo was waiting for him, a human who is not human. Cargo amongst other cargo. Bigger's incapacity to be at home with people is the outcome of events reaching all the way back to Equiano's original exile from the category of human. It is the ongoing legacy of all those slave ships hovering over the face of the Atlantic. A legacy so defining of Bigger's life and circumstances that, in distinction to the rest of a human family that's otherwise cosmologically derived from land, Bigger is alter alternatively imagined as the creation of water. But if blackness's inhabitation of the deep registers exclusion from human sociality and black social death in this way, my book also attends to the emancipatory and ecological ends to which black literature can be recognized to willfully wade in the water in which blackness has historically been weighed. Shifting in this way from the circumscribed frame of human sociality to the interspecies frame of the ecological, I show how blackness's ongoing inhabitation of the deep is otherwise imagined by black literature to embody what I call black ecological life. I recognize such black ecological life even in Bigger Thomas. If in the first instance, Bigger Thomas's desire to inhabit the deep, deep can be read as a desire to consummate a death he already lives socially, what are we to make of the opportunity for merging with the natural world that it presents? So this is the follow-up to uh, the previous quote, extended quote from Native Son. And yet his desire, that is his, his desire to, to inhabit the deep, and yet his desire to crush all faith in him was in itself built upon a sense of faith. The feelings of his body reasoned that if there could be no merging with men, with the men and women about him, there should be a merging with some other part of the natural world in which he lived. Now it's unclear whether Wright recognizes, right recognizes in this aqueous merging with the natural world anything beyond death. But that is not to say that we can't. In fact, I want to propose that inhabitation of the deep, when recognized as exclusion from a social configuration of the human that is itself asocial and anti-ecological, actually uniquely positions blackness to think and enact a more genuinely social, because also ecological, life. Perhaps the very ecological life after which Henry David Thoreau famously groped in his essay, Walking, when recoiling from the modern human separation from nature, he advocated for a vision of man as an, as an inhabitant or part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society. 
Crucially, I argue that the inhabitants of the deep yield precisely such an inhabitant, particularly, particularly as that inhabitant would need to be imagined in proportion to a planet significantly more deep than terra firma. This reality about our blue planet middle-passing middle Africans would have understood better than most. The historiography of the slave trade details that captive Africans were otherwise unfamiliar with the landless realm of the deep sea, and an impossible attempt to represent the terrible wonder of this oceanic encounter, Edward Glissant in his book Poetics of Relation performs a haunting act of ventriloquy. The words may be his, but they sound out questions that, in their unmoored suspense, seem to emerge from the veritable mouths of the Africans hovering over the face of the deep. What kind of river has no middle? Is nothing there but straight ahead? So Glissant voices the bewildered questions that enslaved Africans must have asked of our blue planet. No historical archive testifies to their ever having been asked in just these words, but we need to find some way to hear them anyway. Middle Passage required enslaved Africans to perform a terrific feat of imagination. Theirs was a historical labor of having to make a ground out of no ground, of having to imagine and improvise a human life lived absolutely at sea without even the faintest assurance of arrival. Simultaneous then with the well-remarked suffering endured by middle passing Africans, during the century long tenure, the, during the centuries long tenure of the transatlantic slave trade, proceeded what we have yet to fully appreciate as a collective and sustained inquiry into the nature of the ocean and the prospect of human life at sea. If middle passage is indeed the dawning of blackness, then that dawning significantly proceeded amidst a profound reckoning with the ecological vicissitudes of human life on a blue planet. So my book then, Inhabitants of the Deep, ultimately asks us to consent to the imaginative feat performed by its namesake. It calls us to the urgent work of recalibrating the human, which Alice Walker situates as fundamental to the survival of human life on planet Earth when she asks, where do we start? How do we reclaim a proper relationship to the world? Inhabitants of the Deep proposes we begin with the deep life and deep freedom of middle passing Africans and their descendants with their blue recalibration of human being. Thank you. I think I speak on behalf of all the hundred people who've joined this uh, in thanking you both for those brilliant and generative presentations, which uh, were so capacious. And, and shout out to both of you being able to share so much in 15 minutes. And I was just sort of reflecting, uh, you know, the, the areas that you covered included art and literature and history and geography and ecology, just to name maybe 10% of the fields. And you showed in these two talks and the resonances between them, together with the talks last week, how vital and essential African American studies are for the academy overall, for society, and for humanity. So, thank you for the gift of these uh, 15 minutes each uh, in the conversation to follow. I wanted to start by asking each of you to maybe reflect or comment on, on the other's presentation or prompt a, a question that you may have, but uh, you know each other. But uh, in reflecting on, on what you just heard, I wonder if each of you might for the other have a, have a reflection and or a question. And Jonathan, I'll put you on the spot first uh, to reflect on Elza's uh, presentation. Well, thanks, Michael. Um, I feel like I'm still coming down from my presentation and now trying to remember or recall Elza's presentation. And people could probably empathize with the, with the little bit of anxiety one has whenever they have to. Take your time, yeah. decompress. Yeah, I can go actually. I have a okay, reflection. Great. Okay, go and ahead. I don't I don't necessarily have a question, but maybe I will by the time I finish my reflection, which is like, well, that was amazing, of course. But I also was very 
I guess I'm not surprised, but it was striking um, how much overlap we ended up kind of having um, with these two presentations that were sort of almost not located in the archive, but sort of in, in the middle passage and, and in the ocean. Uh, Equiano, of course, and, and that's the section of Equiano that I teach with Slave Ship and Zong and, and Ellen Gallagher. But this, this language of underwater but not dead uh, was, was really compelling um, to me. This is something that not only comes up in Zong um, and, and in, the, in the back matter when Philip is talking about how, you know, her, how she, she sort of, it occurred to her that maybe she was a descendant of one of the drowned enslaved on, on board the Zong. And, you know, and someone says to her like, oh, well, of course you can't be because they, 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 they died, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, a few months later or something, her daughter says to her, well, what about the children, yeah. right? What about the children on board? Is it just because they, they died doesn't mean there isn't this sort of futurity, I guess. So I thought that was interesting and something I, I wanted, maybe you want to comment on. But the other thing um, that I, I noticed and thought of is the image that I showed of the Ellen Gallagher piece, Whale Fall. Mm. Um, it's, it's really interesting. This is how I learned what whale fall is. Whale fall is what happens when a whale carcass like sinks to the bottom of the ocean um, below like a thousand meters. And what happens is the carcass, um, like as it decomposes, it creates a complex ecosystem that can sustain like underwater life for decades, right? Of deep sea organism, um, because they don't get a lot of you know, nutrients that far down. So for, for Gallagher, like whale fall is, um is is a symbol too of like what it means to sustain life underwater right yeah. and that's why she's interested in whale fall because she's interested in drexia right she's interested in like how is life sustained under the ocean so i just i found that the, the resonance is really really generative and, and exciting and i can't wait for your book <laughs> i can't i can't wait for my book either <laughs> Um, but yeah, I want to thank you for those comments, which are all really helpful. And it's reminding me about what struck me. There were two things that struck me most about your presentation. Once, the first was, um, so your attention to, to Black spatial practice uh, in the mode of Catherine McKittrick has always been very compelling to me. And, and I was really compelled by your treatment of Amir Baraka's slave ship, the, the play. And it's one that I'm not actually that familiar with. And I was especially struck by, uh, under, the under the framework of this uh, rubric of Black spatial practice, the attention you called to the actual, not just the performance of the play, but how both the, the audience, not just the play, but the audience of the play is sort of conscripted into uh, the physical experience of, of being in the slave ship. Um, and it just makes me want to look up the performance history of that, of that particular play. Because uh, it reminds me of a play that I write about in my book, which is August Wilson's Gym of the Ocean, which very similarly um, tries to sort of uh, perform Middle Passage and all, all the different ways that uh, Black writers perform um, or revisit Middle Passage and in, the, in, in theater studies, at least, or in, in drama, perform Middle Passage is, is very interesting to me. And I wonder how, in general, when I think about your work, um, how the space of the theater becomes really interesting uh, because in theater, we find this intersection, this compelling intersection of both the literary and performance, right? Because the words that we read in the play when we're just sitting with the play as a book are also intended to be performed. Um, and then thinking also about, uh, I was struck too about just your decision to, to share about your class and when you're teaching theater or teaching a play, how to offer students a sense of that that physicality of performance that exceeds just the text itself. Um, so I'd have to, I'm excited to, you're, you're reminding me of Amir Baraka's slave ship uh, has me now thinking about um, trying to track down some of the performance history of that play and the decisions that go into to performing it. Thank you both for uh, the reflections on each other's work. And I think, it, again, it underscores a very brief uh, conversation there. What an exciting time it is to be on this campus with your minds and voices and others and, and how the, uh, 
Some will expand thanks to the great work that you're doing and the conversations that you're having uh, uh, with each other and, and with all of us. A question to your own sort of origin in, in, in archival work, what was the gateway? Uh, maybe it was in college, maybe it was before, maybe it was after, but sort of what really was the gateway for you? And if there are any uh, 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 tips that you've learned along the way for those in our audience who may not be yet uh, really deep into archives. So, so how did you get started and a tip or two that you might have to offer uh, for folks listening in? Mm -hmm. Eliza, you want to go first again, Jonathan, whoever? I can. I can go first. Um, yeah, so I guess Gateway. Well, for me, kind of thinking about history and thinking about archives are sort of separate. Not, not separate, but they're two different gateways, I guess. Um, I was raised by a historian, so history was like, all it was everything it was every day it was at the at the dinner table um which made me of course very um antagonistic towards history and i was like that's leave me alone be quiet um but actually you know the first time i i was inside of an archive uh really by myself um was at the schomburg I was working on, I was working for Imani Perry on um, looking for Lorraine. And it was very early in the process um, when she was, was writing the book on, on, on Lorraine Hansberry. And so my job was not to look for anything specific. It was to literally like photograph every single thing that was there. And it was my first time sort of in, in this kind of space. And I think it was a, a fascinating way to, to first encounter an archive where like, I'm not looking for anything. I just get to see this expanse of material that is sort of um, adds up to or, or forms alongside of, of a life. And so that, that way in of kind of being able to be meandering and seeing little, you know, little tiny little scraps of paper and receipts and all kinds of things alongside, you know, FBI files and manuscript, right? Things that are that are kind of uh, more lauded when we think about archival research, um, and just being able to kind of not another whale metaphor, but to just kind of like take it all in and 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 think about okay, how do these things add up? How do they get here? What gets saved? Um, what is sort of important? But but at the same time, I was learning so much about Hansberry and learning so much. Um, and just, just seeing so much from these little things too, from these things that seemed kind of like miscellaneous or seemed kind of like maybe trash or something, right? And it just really reframed that space to me and, and what it meant um, and how much work had gone into getting that, that together, getting it to me, right? To the point where I could go in and, and just take these photographs and sit there every day, you know? Um, so yeah, I would say that that maybe that moment repaired some of my like prior <laughs> feelings about what history was and what what making history and, and doing history is. And I think you know, for me, having been trained to study literature, right? Um, there's something about the kind of creative production and the way that that those that those archives are are curated, right? And they tell a story. And so I'm really interested in the kind of narrative. Um, part the, the way that that these objects can come together and be rearranged and and, and show new things and reveal new things. So, yeah. Glorious, glorious. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I would say for me, there there are these what get what has what got me started were these. So, and I, I touched a little bit on this in, in my presentation. Are these moments, these sort of shimmering moments, little passing moments in, in literature that really grip me? that then make me uh, want to track down where that comes from. Uh, and so the two are, for me, um, the first time I read Equiano's narrative uh, was as an undergraduate, and I came across the phrase inhabitants of the deep, and I couldn't, I originally misread the inhabitants of the deep as fish, because uh, the word inhabitants was a, for lack of a better word, excuse the pun, like a, a sort of red herring for me. I couldn't see human life underwater in that way. Um, and it only dawned on me as I continued to read that like, oh, he's talking about folks who jumped overboard and he's calling them inhabitants of the, of the deep. And it made me become 
incredibly curious about the, the black maritime experience of Middle Passage and tried to track down as much of it as I could and write about it. And I was sort of caught in between uh, the sort of impossibility of the archive uh, for being interested in, in this sort of uh, passing, passing moment that sort of eludes the archive in these ways. And then also the creative ways that both uh, scholars and artists uh, deal with the archive to sort of uh, exhume um, these these moments uh, and, and bring them to life in ways that cause us to, uh, that allows us to preach, appreciate them in a deeper way. Uh, and so another moment like this for me was Glissant and Poetics of Relation when he sort of, uh, he just ventriloquizes a question, like what, what kind of river has no middle, is nothing there but straight ahead? And that to me, that question is a kind of archival practice in and of itself, um, because it knows or it's intuited, it's learned something about the historic experience of Middle Passage, and it offers us access um, into that experience by literalizing these questions that otherwise elude, like the questions must have been asked. Um, but those questions uh, uh, mostly elude the historical archive. And so I think there are just ways in which Black writers and authors creatively engage uh, the historical ar archive in ways that just motivate me to, to do the same ki kind of work. Um, and also embolden me to go into the archive because for the longest time, the archive felt like such a formal place that people like me didn't really belong in, you know? Like what my image of a, who a traditional scholar was and, and people who go into those libraries um, didn't really include, it took a while for me to, to claim that as a space that I actually belong in. Um, and that uh, the work that I want to do um, can, can, can benefit from. So, but that's kind of where I would say I, I sort of got started was my sort of gating. Thank you both for those uh, reflections, which I think also will serve as invitations to others. And uh, it seems like a good time to, to share good news that I just put in the chat. Uh, we uh, were able to say today that beginning next Monday, Yale Library Special Collections, including Beinecke, will once again be open to researchers beyond campus. Very excited about that. The exhibition hall here at Beinecke Library uh, which is open on the weekends, will also be open on weekdays beginning on April 11th. Uh, and as everyone knows on view right now is Michelle Barton's brilliant exhibition, Brava, Women Make American Theater. So I hope uh, all of us are excited, but we just heard Elza and Jonathan share about their stories and great to be able to say that we're able to welcome everyone back to uh, the archives here and in other Yale Library special collections. Number of questions from the audience, and I'm just going to uh, quote them. The first is from our colleague Sandra Enemil, uh, and her question is deep and straightforward. And I'll just put it out and speak it uh, into existence, and, and the two of you can comment. Uh, it is Do we have to have familial lineage to claim someone as an ancestor? I, I could take I could take this up first because um, this is like the this the essential problematic that almost ruined that cinematic moment for me. And I would say no, like the point that I was trying to say, or I, I or that I think I, I I think I was compelled to think about genealogy in a sort of different, more open and generative way for me, um, by that potential logical slip, which even it turns out isn't all that much of a logical slip when we take into consideration the experience of pregnant women on on uh, during the Middle Passage, which various historians write about. Um, but uh, who give birth during, gave birth during Middle Passage. Uh, so, but I would say no. And I think like for me, it's important to think about or the way I've come to think about that moment um, and what Killmonger is claiming in that moment is uh, he's the descendant of a decision, like the decision to inhabit the deep. And, it, and it's just that my work has taken me to a place where that decision to inhabit the deep isn't just a decision about preferring death as opposed to bondage, it's also a decision about what constitutes life on a blue planet. Um, and that really all the, all, everyone who lived through Middle Passage, whether they jump ship or lived to see the other side of the Atlantic, inhabited the deep insofar as they had to imagine what life was would be like um, absolutely at sea. 
because there was no assurance of arriving at some elsewhere besides like the sort of like suspended now, now the Atlantic. And I think you can claim a gene genealogy of descent um, in that unorthodox way, like to be the descendant of a, of a decision. Um, and in a lot of ways, a lot of people write about or teach, uh, write about blackness um, and its origin, its middle pa potential middle passage origins as I, I, I'm convinced by that. Um, and also, I think that I like to think about it in terms of um, a decision like blackness is like the ongoing inhabitation of the deep. So I've come to at least think about my own genealogy that way um, as like I'm, I'm descended from folks who decided uh, to live on such a planet uh, and to hazard life on such a planet. Um, and I, I, it need not be entirely re uh, reducible to like blood genealogy. Well, is there any comment on the question? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that was more of a question for Jonathan, but I, I, I agree with, with, <laughs> with what you just said, Jonathan. I also think, you know, on a really kind of um, practical, like basic level, so many Black families are, are constituted by people who have adopted, who have taken on mm -hmm. other people's kids, yeah. who have, you know, like, my, I just found out that my grandfather's like last name was something else. And, you know, it's like, this is sort of just a cultural practice also, right? Is that that yeah. idea of the nuclear family and, and these, these sort of linear lines of um, descendants are, are not really real. That's not how it's lived, right? Yeah. Um, for a lot of black families. And so I think just on that level, like, you know, we, we, we already, claim ancestors who are not blood related to, to, to us, right, but who have cared for us. Um, I would say on the more kind of theoretical, political, aspirational level, you know, I, I believe that we're all fundamentally interdependent, right, and entangled with each other, right, so even to, to sort of um, to sort of think of, of the kind of individuation that, that that kind of sense of family requires, I think goes against the kind of the kind of earth thing, right, that that Jonathan is talking about. Um, and you know, that's part of why I'm interested in that, in that whale fall, right? In that whale becoming a part of, right, a, a part of nature in a different way, right? In a, a different sense of relation where you don't have these uh, distinctions necessarily between um, between human water, right? Um, so yeah, I guess those are those are some of the things I would put out there. Appreciate it, and and uh, the original questioner or colleague Sandra Enemil uh, says descendant of a decision. I like that. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Mm -hmm. um, we have a a, a comment um, that has a question, and Jose, you can you can say yes, no, maybe. Uh, the comment is Eliza Kelly's reflections and how she thinks about history and archives is mind blowing. I wonder if she could teach an online Coursera course. Uh, and and the chat is full of people with uh, thanks for each and both of you and interest in uh, learning more from you. So I know that everyone's excited about your book forthcoming and likewise Eliza, uh, folks excited to hear and see more from you. A question from Melissa Barton, and I'll quote this in its entirety. Both of your projects seem to identify a need for a response to a history rightly focused on death and suffering, especially the history of the Middle Passage. Why do you think this turn to an alternative to this history has happened now, or why has that need presented itself for each of you? Hmm. So I'm just reading the, the question over again so I can make sure I've understood it. Um, what, so I don't know, I'm not sure that it's an, an alternative history, like the need for an alternative history is, is temporally rooted in, in the present so, so much as it's been, I view it as like a, or I experience it at least in, in the reading as like a, a persistent need. It's kind of the condition of of black life, <laughs> like a, and and black artistic practices. We always need another history. Um, but that said, like for for in this particular, but I do think the the what drives the the imagination of these alternative histories 
is power, powerfully inflected by the now of our particular president. And so for me, in this work and the turn to the ecological and a sort of ecological reconsideration of Middle Passage um, as an oceanic encounter, um, the need comes from the environmental crisis. And uh, I think it's in, for what drives me, what has driven me to it is my own response and a lot of other people's response to uh, the environmental uh, crisis and, and ongoing climate catastrophe. Um, so I, I think that's part of what part of what informs it. And and there are obviously a, a bunch of ways in which climate catastrophe um, is all bound up with um, oceanic realities, like with uh, sea level rise, et cetera. And so and that's part of what my, my work is interested in, is like the sort of intersection between uh, ecological crisis and, and black life and death. Um, and so that's how I would sort of answer it, at least. Um, uh, the the need to sort of reconfigure our history in this way and and think about it also ecologically. Um. Um, yeah, I would I would add to that. Um, I think that there's a real sense of the the foreclosing of of a future for for everybody, not just for Black people, but I think Black people feel bear the brunt of that, right? But there's a sense of sort of um, wow, capitalism seems even stronger than ever, right? And even more totalizing, and it's even harder to opt out. And it's, you know, we can't take care of ourselves, right? And people can't find places to live, right? They can't find jobs, right? There's all this, this sense of, of a kind of, um, of, of totality that I think gives rise to certain kinds of pessimism and not just gives rise to it, but, but kind of like, like uh, allows it to justify it itself, right? It gives it gives reason for it. Um, I think there's a lot of like narratives about uh, the Anthropocene, right? And the sort of the end of, of the earth, um, the end of kind of um, life, life as we know it. And I think that that's, that's kind of the more, um, the more maybe externally induced reason um, but I actually think that for the last 30 years, you know, we've, we've seen this kind of push and pull of um, imagining something new in the gaps of the archive, right? And a kind of pessimism, right, about, about that. Um, and, and actually, I, I might even go so far as to say that a lot of the imaginative work that ends up being like um, seeing possibility in, in, in these sort of other kinds of fixed um, um, ways of thinking about the world, um, that work comes out of um, really intense melancholy and senses of loss and senses of pessimism and senses of you know, seeing anti-Blackness as something that is kind of like um, everywhere, all encompassing and forever, right? And so it's like, Sometimes those th those those alternative histories are actually the same as those like um, concerns and 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 uh, preoccupations with death, right? With our deaths, with our, with our premature death. Um, so actually, I, I would think of those things together. Um, I feel like you know Venus in two acts, right? Like what what Saidia Hartman is talking about with critical fabulation. Um, Wayward Lives is this like beautiful book, but you know, it comes out of like Venus in two acts, right? It comes out of this kind of like real sense of the brutality and, and, and the, this kind of wall, right? That Hartman is coming up against in the archive. Um, and this sort of like sense of a, a, a desire to make something different that, that is impossible at the same time, right? Um, so yeah, so I guess it's, it's, I think impossible to separate those two strains of history. <laughs>